Being fresh is more important than having money. The entire time I grew up, I only wanted money so I could be fresh. How do you rock? I sport it fresh, Holmes. Word, word. <laughs> You wanted everybody to know that you was down with this movement. Hip hop fashion was, we're not gonna follow the rules mentality. No money might have had 50 cents between us. And we were fresh. It's all about that flair, what you look like. How does it radiate off of you? I look good. Back in the day, you got on the Lees, Pumas, BVD, Tank Top. It was all part of the hip hop fashion. Come on. You did your own thing. You could paint your own design with your jean jacket. Jeans that were four or five sizes too big. Everybody's pants were big. Being fly, being unique, being special. The most important thing was sneakers. I could wear a brand new pair of sneakers every day for seven and a half years. That's a fact. Tommy Hilfiger would show up in the hood. It was like the drug dealer giving you a free hit. I didn't even have furniture in my house, man, but I had polo everywhere. Back in the day, it was about high-end brands. The first thing I would do was go to Yves Saint Laurent, to Louis Vuitton, a Gucci. With the explosion of hip-hop music, now we're seeing clothes that made you proud of your ethnicity. From the ghetto, for the ghetto, for the street. Cross colors went from a zero to a hundred million dollars. It was the embodiment of swagger. The success birthed a series of other entrepreneurs that decided we want to create our own brands too. It was on fire. Whoever had an apparel company got to win. Being in New York, all the streets were like runways for different clothing brands. For Sean John, if Ralph was doing it, we wanted to do it just as good or even better. I just had to like get my fresh up to a whole nother level. In hip hop fashion right now, people are taking way more risks. I can be whoever I want to be. You feel free, then you're going to dress like you're free. And that's what freedom is, to be yourself. When you are fresh and people notice, when you right here know it, you feel like Superman. Okay, first of all, talk about that title because I love the title of this movie so much. Well, growing up in New York uh, in the 70s and 80s, the term that was very popular was fresh. And working with that term and remembering what the idea of fresh meant and connecting it to fashion, you know, fresh meant something that was fresh out of the box, something that was new and clean, and connecting that idea to the bigger ideas I wanted to explore in the film uh, made the title feel right for me. And when did you first meet Dapper Dan? When did you first go to the show? Well, I first personally met Dapper Dan doing this film. Um, I wasn't uh, financially fit at the time. <laughs> uh, I, my money wasn't right back then, largely because I was a, a young man, so I couldn't really afford Dapper Dan, but I knew him from his work, from iconic album covers like Eric B and Rakim, from music videos from the drug dealers in my neighborhood who actually could afford his clothing. Um, so there was always the legend of Dapper Dan. There'd always been stories about Dapper Dan, but I had never personally met the man until I had the privilege of interviewing him for the film. And he uh, is a man full of many sound bites, including Black and Eyes, which is one of my favorite moments in the film. You'll see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, talk about that, Black and Eyes, because that's basically what you did with fashion was you sort of made it about us, didn't you? Yeah, you know, I didn't, um, I never thought of it as what I was doing, but it was something that, a tradition that just flowed through me. And then after I started getting all the attention, I was saying, well, they wanted to know, well, what, what was the big difference? And when I looked at myself, I said, well, this is what we do. I guess this is blackenizing it. You know, this is making it Harlem. So uh, that's, that's pretty much what um, my focus was, to uh, dress my community in, in, in a way that they was used to be looking. Mm. One of the things I told you just a few minutes ago when I was talking to you, Sasha, was one of the flashpoints for me in the movie in Sundance was I screamed with laughter when I saw Channing Tatum coming down the runway and Sean John, well, I guess wearing some kind of Korean dog fur coat, I don't know what that was. <laughs> but I just, I scream with laughter, because that's, if that's not about 
you, you go basically from Sean John to step up to Magic Mike. I mean, that's not about the culture coming together in so many ways. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, hip-hop has become an American commodity. You know, it's just like anything else, like rock and roll. Initially, it was a very scary thing. It came from a, dare I say, dark place. Um, hip-hop as well came from, dare I say, a dark place. And then, oh, the original sort of locus of it, that was about, about, about the party, you know, the house party, kicking it like that, and wearing your hottest, freshest gear into somebody's basement party where nobody could see it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was about being stylish and it was about uh, having an identity and, and standing out and making a statement with your clothing. I like to say that clothing, especially in hip hop, is language. And, and because growing up, I, can tell, I could tell where you were from, you know? I could tell you were from Brooklyn if you wore Clark shoes because that was a very Jamaican thing and it was a large Jamaican population in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, Harlem, you know, this guy, he, he won't stop with Harlem, but he is, you know, you got to give it up to Harlem. I mean, Harlem just historically has had a very strong style, you know. The steering so. body. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from Queens, by the way. I'm very proud to be from Queens. Yeah. Queens is in the house. Yes. But, you know, you still got to give it up to up, Uptown for a lot of really Yes, thank you for things. the tepid applaud for Queens, by the way. The, the very low energy applause. You're just saving it till the end. I feel you. I know. <laughs> Who was the first hip-hop artist to come into the shop? Listen, it, it's between, well, let's talk about the first ones with money. I can remember them easier. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, no, money. but uh, it was between LL Cool J and uh, the Fat Boys, possibly the Fat Boys. It was a toss-up between the two. Yeah. Um, and um, I believe it was the Fat Boys first. Did they have a particular request, like, or did you make stuff that was... No, they had a, a well, the, well, the fact was, they had a particular re, a request because um, they wanted to have uh, Louis Vuitton and they wanted to have Gucci and they knew that for them to have it on was huge because they were huge. Literally. So, literally. literally, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, in fact, um, Buffy could not get in the front door. I remember that. And we needed. I'm sorry, what's that? Yeah, literally. He Buff, get Buffy, one, okay. rest in peace, we Buffy. We had to bring him through the back, and we, especially, and, and we needed two tape measures. So to, to yeah, you know, tape 60 inches. So uh, we, had, we, we used a 60 inch tape, and we used a tooth measure. So that was huge for us to have them as an act. And, they, and at the time, they were the first rappers. The reason I remember them so well is because they were the first rappers that actually had money. Because a lot of the uh, first rappers that come to the store, they, um, they didn't have money. Um, for instance, um, Andre Orell, who was a friend of mine, and when Puffy was a, he was still a, an intern, Andre Orell office was way out there in Brooklyn. And he used to come and borrow outfits for his acts. So they didn't even have money then. In fact, the rappers used to have to wait until the hustlers left the store before they could even come in and get measured. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, that's the movie I want to see, the rappers <laughs> hanging in the corner waiting for the hustlers to leave. Yeah. Um, What's so much, what's so great about this movie though is it's really it's a lot of fun. I mean, even though there are a lot of ideas in it, and there's so much energy in it. Talk about the idea of bringing all that energy of hip hop into the filmmaking. Yeah, as someone who's been a journalist for many years, and as someone who grew up in the culture, you know, I'm pretty well aware of who the folks are going to be who have big personalities who can really push the story. And I, I you know, I, I you you look at someone like Dan, whose story is amazing. Uh, there's a guy named Thurston Howell III, who's a leader of a gang called the Low Lifes. Low is short for polo, um, and they all they do is wear polo. Um, these folks are big personalities, and I think hip hop is about large personalities. So, the the energy and the fun that you're experiencing is not only exploring the style and the importance and the influence that folks like Dan have had, but it's also the people um, with big ideas and big dreams and lots of creativity. And I. A lot of that is expressed through the interviews. Well, at some point, though, Dan, everybody came through that, that store, didn't they? I mean, you have from boxers to rappers to the gangsters. Everybody came, everybody fell through, didn't they? Yeah, we, we got all kind of customers, all but the middle class. We didn't get the middle. It seems at the time, middle class wouldn't gravitate. It was more like the um, subcultural class in Harlem that gravitated well because those are the ones who didn't care about 
where it came from, as long as it looked good. And the other ones was more concerned about, oh, I wouldn't go in there. So until it crossed over and they saw the styles and, 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 and hip hop, hip hop became prominent and then it became like, oh, I had to have that. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, not only is he an innovator, he's an educator because a lot of folks in the inner city weren't familiar with these quote unquote luxury brands. So their first experience with Louis mm -hmm. is through his remix. And, you know, what is hip hop? Hip hop is reimagining things that we don't see ourselves in. You know, we didn't see ourselves in those brands. Mm -hmm. So this man said, you know what, I'm, I like what these folks are doing. Let me reimagine it for us. And so much too is literally about sampling, and you talk about people who wouldn't who would come to your stores, and the middle class wouldn't come there. But so many middle class people, those stores you're talking about, took what you did, and let's not say stole, let's say sample what you did with their brands. I mean, you were taking their brands and doing stuff that they could never imagine doing with it. Yeah, you know the amazing thing about all this, like the uh, I didn't get uh, any attention from black media. And, but uh, I started getting a lot of attention from the first the European media and, and other places like that, magazines early on, and the New Yorker, and and then that's when people start paying, you know, the middle class start paying close attention to me. And I started to, and perhaps the biggest thing was when Mike Tyson had the fight in the store. I didn't want to like, bring that up, but yeah, okay. It was like, well, who is this? You know, and a lot of people was unaware that, um, you know, Naomi Campbell came through. Veronica Webb, Miss America, and all these people came through early on. So, I mean, and this is something that's just recently getting uh, people's attention. It's like, oh, okay. Now you talk about, you mentioned the, the, the Butch Lewis, Mike Tyson thing, but that was at 3 o'clock in the morning. I mean, because you, you could go to Dapper Dan's and break out any time of the day or night. Well, you know what? One of the uh, things I wanted to offer was to be open 24 hours a day. So I was open 24 hours a day for nine years. And to accommodate, you know, the subculture that took place in Harlem because they would want to come to the store after a party, after a dance, it didn't matter. You know, and uh, guys like, some guys just come to be in the presence of some of the gangsters that I was familiar with. You know, and um, so this relationship developed between hip hop and, and, and the street culture, the subculture that was there. And, it, and it, in fact, it plays itself out today. You see the, how the uh, rappers always talk about that sub gangsters, if you please, you know, and that was like the birth of it. When you see the hip hop guys and, and the hustlers, and the hustlers was coming to Dapper Dan, the gangsters was coming to Dapper Dan. So the hip hop artists, knowing that the power structure was with the hustlers, so they gravitated towards the style that the hustlers were, and then the hip hop fashion developed out of that. Until today, words, in other words, the the rappers weren't going to Fifth Avenue to dress to be around Donald Trump, they were coming to be around the folks in their community who actually, for better or for worse, exactly. could afford it. Because it really is that, that thing that hip hop was, that wherever a party could grow out of nowhere in the most unlikely places and just things would blow up out of that. And that spirit, that kind of energy you're talking about, you know, where style starts, everybody wants to be around that, that's what the film is kind of about too, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it was combustible. I mean, I just remember growing up, uh, you know, it's easy for me as an, uh, as an adult to kind of take a political stance on a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, everyone remembers being young and everyone remembers wanting to fit in. And in the world that I came from, you know, a pair of sneakers meant everything. You know, a, a pair of suede pumas or Adidas superstar sneakers, you know, these shoes that were intended for athletes to wear, not for kids to wear who didn't want to mess them up, who wanted to look nice. You know, I remembered, you know, what that meant. And then I think about how things, you know, I'm, I'm the creative director of a magazine called Mass Appeal, and I still work with a lot of young people. <laughs> and I see how important sneakers are today, you know, how... This what do you mean? <coughs> well, yeah, I mean... You know, <coughs> I saw my man today, you know, I had the, Stan, the iridescent Stan Smiths. I thought I was killing it, but then my man came in with some other more crispy Stan Smiths. I'm sorry, and I what? Was like, Is know. that me? I'm sorry. The, the first fresh pair of sneakers you got, you have to remember them. What were they? I believe they were uh, suede. What color? 
blue suede Pumas. I mean, no disrespect. Yeah, no disrespect to Elvis, but don't don't step on my blue suede Pumas. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Boo. I'm sorry. Oh, you know. <laughs> They're saying Bruce out there. Um, what? <laughs> tell me what got you into this, Dan? The idea of just making these these pieces. What got you into the making clothes? What, what, how did you start? I'm sorry. What got you into making clothes? How did you get started? Uh, what may, actually made me get started? Um, seeing the value that uh, I think a customer came in the store, and I think he had a Louis Vuitton. M men at the time were just getting to uh, Louis Vuitton little pouches, and, and the, uh, the gangsters had them because theirs was full of money. <laughs> so um, he ca they came in one, and I got the, this concept. I said, wait a minute. If he's getting all this attention with a pouch, imagine if he had a jacket or a coat. And so the concept developed from that. I just, just built around that whole I tell you, I remember the first time I saw somebody with those coats, and I just stopped him. He's like around, like a, walking in front of the apostle. Where did you get that from? He goes, I ain't telling you. I went, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, that was the best kept secret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that idea of, of, of people wanting information is a big part of the movie, too. Because once you see somebody with that pair of fresh sneakers or that Vuitton jacket, you want to know where it came from. And the idea of trying to keep this stuff close to yourself is really part of hip-hop culture, too, isn't it? Well, yeah, well, back then, this is before the Internet. You know, you really had to be plugged in to know where and who, da who Dan was and where he was, you know. And so it was competitive. You know, hip-hop was born out of gang culture, and gangs are competitive. And once the gangs kind of faded and the rise of the B-boy and the B-girl happened, the sense of competition, whether it's dance, whether it's the art, whether it's the music, and the fashion was also competitive. So... You didn't want anyone to have what you had, you know. Exactly. That was the whole thing. That that's what's so powerful about the what the essence of, of hip hop is. It's about being original, about standing out. And so you're taught at a young age, yo, you you don't want to be a biter. You don't want to look like you don't want to bite off of someone else's style. You want to be original. Exactly. And Dan epitomized that. You went to Dan, and he customized something that no one else in the world would have. And that's why it cost you a whole lot of money, right, Dan? Yeah, but the money was available to those who was getting the money. You know, I mean, it wasn't meant for everybody. But like I wasn't when, getting money, man. <laughs> I couldn't afford it. Yeah, yeah, at that time, yeah. But uh, it was like the gangsters had all the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's because it was it was Harlem hip hop, and then there was Queens, and there's the Bronx. I mean, each area had its own kind of style and own the things that they wore that made you could tell where somebody's from based on what they were wearing, couldn't you? Yeah, but I think if you were wearing Dapper Dan, it just meant you were getting money. It didn't yeah. matter what borough you were from. Yeah. You knew it was Dapper Dan, and that just said you were getting money. But that speaks to something else that's important to me in the film, communicating this idea of, in the inner city, this sort of sense of self-worth being attached to clothing and how you know, what you wear a lot of times dictates your standing in the community and sometimes how we actually tear each other down if we can't afford particular things. So it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's like this film is about celebrating the innovations and innovators like Dapper Dan, but I also wanted to explore and examine and take a look at, you know, who we are and why we do some of the things we do. This one thing we just talked about a few minutes ago. So much of black culture was, again, in the state of California, people of color couldn't own houses. It was in the law until the mid-80s. You weren't legally allowed to have a house. So if you couldn't have a house, what were you going to do to show who what you what you were? You you bought clothes, you bought a car, you bought these things that show if you couldn't do one thing, you could at least say, "I'm here, I'm in America right now," couldn't you? Exactly. Yeah, and I, and I think it boils down to even when Dan talks about Harlem and the passion he has, you know, hip hop is about attitude and energy. So at the end of the day, when you don't own anything, the the you know the the baseball cap, right? Kids wear baseball caps. They're fans of baseball. Maybe they'll fold the brim. But in hip hop, we tilted it in a particular way that that says that you're hip hop and that communicates the energy and the attitude and goes back to what I was saying about language. If you see me with my head tilted to a side, tilted to the side during a certain period of, you know, during the, the rise of hip hop, you knew who I was and what I was saying and what and what that hat projected, which was energy and spirit. And so when people don't own anything, at least African Americans in this country, the one thing that everyone seems to want from us is our dance and our music and our fashion and our mm. sense of pride and the pride we take in the way we dress. What's this thing, uh, I'll address this to you too, Dan. For us, 
for people of color, we are our art form, aren't we? The way we dress, the way we walk, the way we talk. That's, if we can't have a house, you, if you don't paint, our, we become our own art form, don't we? Yeah, and you know what's, what's so interesting about that is like, any element of our culture, like, we have Sylvia's restaurant, so that's soul food. Anybody can, I mean, we got Chinese cook really good soul food now. But what keeps regenerating is our fashion and our music. Those are, the, those are the two elements that we gravitate towards to and that renews itself each time. So um, I was happy for the element when hip hop came in because it gave us this vehicle for the whole world to see like, this is how we feel, this is what we're saying, this is what we're doing. We feel good, we don't have any money, we're gravitating towards money and we feel good about ourselves. So I was happy about bringing that to life and for the, this whole global view of us and like that. And in addition to that, I opened up a whole world for guys to come off the corner and say, well, I can sell clothes. I don't have to sell drugs, you know? So, and, 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 I, and all that I'm doing, I feel most, the, the best about that. But as you were saying this about fashion and things changing so much, there's been so much in hip hop culture and black culture too is so much about looking forward, almost as if we forget our sense of history. You know, I don't want to be seeing what you were wearing last week. That, that's, that's for chumps. I can't go out like that. That's kind of the sad part of the culture, isn't it? Well, I think, I think a lot of young folks of color in this country feel like their lives are disposable. And because everything is so short-lived, you're not thinking about valuing what you created in the past and creating capital you're thinking about, well, what can I do? What's next? What's next? What's next? And I think uh, you listen to popular radio, and they'll say, back in the days, 2007. Like, back in the days is like, you know, pyramids. You know what I mean? 2007 is not a long time ago. So, you know, these are the types of ideas that I wanted to explore in the film. But even in hip-hop, though, so much of hip-hop, especially in the early days, was about calling out somebody, you know? You know, you're over, you're done, you're a punk. I mean, even that, that idea is you talked about before, the dozens, that idea of just sort of like rolling this stuff over and moving on to the next thing. Yeah, I mean, the dozens, you know, snapping on each other, ranking on each other. There's, an art, there's a real art form to being super creative, finding creative ways to tear someone down. At the same time, you know, I don't know if other, is, you know, is there an Asian version of the dozens? Maybe there is. <laughs> but I think that, you know, African Americans have you know, we're known for the blues, right? The dozens is a form of blues. It's sort of exercising and expressing, you know, pain and, you know, finding irony in pain and laughing at it. But at a certain point, it's like if all of your art is often consumed with being, you know, tearing yourself down, or if you're bred to be a consumer and not bred to be an innovate, you know, to own your own stuff, if it's more about attaching your identity to these brands that weren't necessarily made for you to feel better about yourself. And that's just Americans in general. Yes. Americans in general are addicted to shopping, but inner cities, sometimes we, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on what we wear and the value of it and how it is connected to who we are. And hopefully, you know, we can, this film will help people think and talk about that. Yeah, we have any questions out there, we can get a microphone to you guys. But as you're talking about that, uh, I just think about what punk was. You know, punk came out of this, especially in the UK, you put a safety pin in your cheek and you put a tattoo across your face because you were saying, I don't want to be part of the mainstream, I'm never going to get a job. And there's a punk ethos to a lot of hip hop too. We're talking about the NWA wearing prison clothes. I mean, literal prison clothes. Well, the difference is, well, first of all, you're from Detroit, so you should know, or you already know, it. punk started in Detroit with the MC5. Yes, I do. And the MC5, Stooges. no, and Question Mark and the Mysterians. There you go. But punk is a choice. Punk was largely a, a movement, you know, associated with young white folks, and they made the choice sure. to put safety pins in their noses or whatever. You can take that safety pin out and be white again. Hip hop is not a choice. Hip hop is a reaction to society. In a weird way though, it's also about this ownership of being disenfranchised, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's the ownership of being disenfranchised and f trying to find the humor in it while maintaining your dignity and pride. Because that's the only way you can really operate. Um, this question is from Periscope. They want to know, who is somebody that 
you dressed that nobody would have ever thought you dressed. Please say Barack Obama. Please say Barack Obama. <laughs> Let, me, let me make sure I understand the question. Who is somebody that I addressed that nobody else would have gotten to dress? No, that nobody would have expected. That, that nobody would have ever thought that you would yeah, would come to you. Like Mitt Romney. Tell me you made Mitt Romney's shoes or something. Just something like that. Oh, Even oh, if it's not oh, true, oh, just okay. say it. Okay. Um, who would that be? That would probably be um, Don King. Yeah. Don King. <laughs> what did you make for Don King? Uh, Don King had, had this really you put great your, Hold your microphone up. Uh, Don King had this real great personality. When Mike Tyson would come to the store, if uh, Mike Tyson sat there and say, Dad, make me a, a polo suit, you know, with all the polo horses on it. And Don King would jump up, yo, I want the same thing too. Anything, <laughs> <laughs> anything that Mike Tyson wanted, you know, Don King said, make me one too, Dapper Dan. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was really, uh, I think he would be the one that. Uh, Especially since Mike Tyson's probably paying for it, if you pardon the expression. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I, as I wonder that too, I wonder. When you're making things for yourself, I me, mean, because you're wearing this beautiful, beautiful outfit right now, what do you think about when you're making clothes for you? What do you want to get across? You know what? Um, because of my parents, I remember my mother saying, boy, don't you ever get caught out on that street and your clothes be dirty. I'm not going to own you. So my, th <laughs> my thing has always been to dress according to where you're going to go and who, who you're going to be around. Okay. Like I have... Dominican friends, and I know how they dress. If I go to a Dominican club, I'm going to fit in. And not only am I going to fit in, I try to use uh, this, this concept. Well, I know their style, so I'm going to do their style better than they do it so that I can get that attention. So wherever I'm going, I'm going to try to create a look that fits in but makes me stand out. So. Go to another question? Yeah. Hi, I have two questions for you. Uh, one is, how did you get your start in the industry? And number two is, what would you say the, the style is now for a lot of the, um, the guys in, um, in the entertainment business right now? I heard the first question. I'm going to address that. But what was the second? Um, how has the style changed from um, the 1970s and 80s? What is the emphasis now on the style that... Um, okay. I'll go to the first one. The first one, um, I got my start. I was, I was pretty much, I didn't have anybody inside the industry to uh, teach me anything about the industry. So it was a, basically a trial and error. But what I did was I would go to uh, the industrial trade shows to look at the equipment that made the, that made the clothes. And um, my thing was to know, to look at somebody and see what they were wearing and to figure out, exactly how that was made. So I taught myself all of that in the beginning, and then I just, I, I stayed away from the, uh, you know, the uh, organized uh, trade industry and taught myself everything and, and functioned completely separate from that. All right. Now, the second question, uh, how has child styles changed? Well, what I noticed over the years is that the younger generation tend to lean towards their own identity, and then later on, they just blend right in. So what's interesting now is like um, the amount of attention that uh, ASAP Rocky is generating. So that's an ex exciting person for me to watch now, to see um, where he takes style, and then to see how he comes back, you know, or if he comes back. But I, I haven't seen nothing in, since I've been making clothes where the styles change and then remain changed. We always go back to that like kind of classic look. Yeah, like what you're wearing right now. That's almost a classic '60s kind of thing with that kind of lean. Yeah, well, what I put on today is like I said, I'm, I'm gonna be around these people, so I gotta look kind of suity, but I can't look suity. So I gotta, I gotta do something that's gonna make me look like them, but like me. So I, try, <laughs> so that's what I did today. You look entirely. Like you, nobody else can look like that. <laughs> Sasha, let me ask you this question. What, how would you define style? I mean, I think style is whatever you feel comfortable in. You know, personally, since I've done this film, people have been asking me, you know, so you're the style guy. And I'm like, I'm not the style guy at all. Like, I'm more interested in why people wear what they wear as opposed to what they wear personally because it's a. It's so you're wearing this outfit and you're saying you're not about style. I want to make sure I got this straight. This is just 
It's clearly not about coordination because there's a lot going on. <laughs> I would never say that to your face, but wow. I would say that clearly you have an eye for stuff that's distinctive, don't you? Well, I think when, when hip-hop is in your DNA, it's just a natural extension of how you see the world. And again, fashion is language. So some people speak English better than others, and I'm sure that there are people who dress better than I do, but maybe there's a level of communication that's inside of the way I dress based on the way I, I was raised. The question here? Question. Hey, what's up? Um, do you still feel like that since like we're in like the millennium that New York is as far as not the king of fashion, hip hop, as far as hip hop goes anymore? Since in the 80s, for example, you could tell when somebody was from, like came from the South, and the first thing you know is in New York, the way they dressed. Now it's pretty much mainstream. Do you still feel like New York is the fashion king of hip hop anymore, or is it just mainstream now? Is it level play? Uh, do I feel like it's still a mainstream? I think there's a, a I think social media changed that a lot. And uh, first it used to be like, how I generated attention in the beginning is because major gangsters came from around the country, because, you know, people, tend to, uh, birds of a feather tend to flock together, so the word would go out like that. But social media now, um, my perception of fashion today is like, as it was back then, powerful personalities or powerful individuals determine fashion. So, and even though if, if Harlem generates the type of powerful rappers that really make a difference, I think it will change nationally. But, um, to answer the question, I think that the, it has changed a lot, and I don't know if New York um, is still a leading factor, but I think, I think that a, a lot of people will, they don't digress too far from what New York is about. Yeah. You want to respond to that too? That's a pretty interesting question. Do you feel like New York is still kind of the epicenter of all of this culture, hip hop, and fashion? <sighs> Well, if I bring it back to growing up, you know, again, the, the, the idea people had distinct looks based on where they were from, what borough they were from, right? So that was the exposure that we had then. Now with the internet, even if you're not in New York, as Dan has said, you know, uh, the influence of New York is st can still be felt, you know? So I think because of the internet, the world is a lot smaller and there are opportunities for people everywhere to sort of have really strong styles and it's not necessarily tied into New York anymore, but we're still number one and the greatest. Yeah. So, whatever. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all should be ashamed of yourselves for applauding at that. Let me ask you this, though, because in, in watching the film, there's such an interesting group of people in it you know, going from Andre Leon Talley to Sean to Pharrell. I mean, whose insights about all this stuff surprised you the most? Well, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years. Um, I had never interviewed Kanye West. So it's like you hear about Kanye West, you see Kanye West. He's the one who's going to say George Bush doesn't care about black people and other people. You don't know what he's going to say. And, um, you know, on a, on a moment's notice, you know, the film was pretty much done. I didn't think we were going to get him. And then they're like, hey, can you get Kanye tomorrow in Mexico? You know, so it was like, OK, I don't know what's going to happen. And sitting with Kanye and engaging him and talking to him about something he's very passionate about in the film, he said really insightful things. Um, and so I, I, it was interesting to see how serious he was about fashion. You know, he, had sh he showed us, you know, uh, his sneaker, you know, uh, before they came out. And you saw the Yeezy first? Yeah, and he was asking us all these questions, and he asked me, he's like, yo, so how much did these sell for? And I was like, I don't know, buck 20, buck 50? And he's like, you crazy, <laughs> crazy. I ain't selling my sneakers for, you know. So I'm like, I'm sorry, man, I never paid more than $100 for a pair of sneakers. <laughs> I'm from the era where you, you spend $100 on three pairs so you can switch them up so your sneakers didn't get messed up. The point I'm trying to make, though, Kanye said some really smart, insightful things. He's really passionate about fashion and really wants to, you know, uh, I don't want to say impose his will, but he's, as, as <laughs> but he yet, is. But, but yet you did. 
<laughs> I did, but I, I think, you know, he's, he's a visionary with his music, and I think that he really is serious about expressing himself through fashion in a very serious way. Let me ask you, uh, who, the person who came to the store, who knew the most about style? Some of those people said, I want this, because a lot of times people come in, they want, they come to ideas, but you have to bring these ideas together. Who came in with, like, the most kind of concrete idea about the, what he wanted to wear? And, and was a real kind of a fashion forward thinker. Are you talking about when I first started or up till now? Yeah, when you first well, started up and now. up you till now. You know what? What's amazing is I think um, Pretty Boy Floyd. Yeah. He's, I mean, he will not let anyone, he won't lose anyone's ideas. He might modify it, okay. but he wants, he wants it the way. You give him a great idea and he'll build on it, but he's, you're not going to dictate fashion to him. Well, and that's what's amazing about him. And um, I can't think of nobody who's, um, who's more opinionated about what they should wear than him. And do you find yourself agreeing with him, or do you just kind of... Well, you know, the customer's always right. <laughs> 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 Let's start there. <laughs> but uh, if I... Um, <laughs> I had to say it, and I would, you know, hint to them, i say, remember one thing. Everything in your mind might not look that good on your behind. I just, <laughs> so I just would drop little things like that on it. You know, but you never know about fashions because, you know, it's like my opinion of fashion is that powerful people create fashion. Powerful personalities. Like it, this is an instrument, an interesting experiment. When you look at Pharrell, Kanye, and ASAP, Rocky, this is so interesting to see what effect that their styles is going to have globally. If it's going to get picked up and, and everybody's going to accept and, 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 and embrace that look, you know? Because uh, it's interesting, you talk about that, you think about, you know, for example, what these guys do. I mean, uh, each one of these guys you're talking about is taking a sneaker and put them on the map, you know? I mean, uh, Rocky and Kanye and, and Pharrell, each one of these. So finally, it goes back to sneakers in the end, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, in hip hop, the popular belief is, you know, getting fresh starts with your feet first. And uh, there's a guy in my film named Mayor who has, you know, this, you know, he can wear a brand new pair of sneakers every day for seven years. And, you know, his collection's worth well over half a million dollars. But when you think about, when you see the film and you learn about how that happened, you know, his mom bought him a pair of sneakers. They were called Mark V sneakers. No one's ever heard of them because they're really cheap. But he was happy because his name was Mark. He went back to the block, all smiles, and then everyone laughed at him because they're like, what kind of cheapo sneakers are those? And that sort of, uh, how he was received in his neighborhood at, at that moment, he vowed that he would never be laughed at again. He would never be laughed off his block. And here he is, a man who's 40, who has more sneakers than anyone else. I mean, on one hand, it's like if he had lots of cat cats all over the place and like tumbleweed, he'd be considered a hoarder. Instead, everything is very neat and clean. So maybe he's just really obsessed with sneakers. But either way, that obsession launched a long time ago when he was a little boy and was, and was laughed at by his peers. And so these are the kinds of ideas that the film explores. You and know, this sneaker thing is, is really unusual because, like... Do you wear sneakers? No. The reason I don't wear sneakers is because when I was growing up and you wore sneakers, you were very poor. You know, so we carried our sneakers. <laughs> I mean, we, we grew up at a, a different time. The sneakers we had had holes in them. That's a whole other interview. But anyway... <laughs> but anyway... This sneaker thing, like Kanye could promote a sneaker, but everybody could wear Kanye's sneaker, whichever he come out with, or, or, any, any, or any other uh, fashion leaders, but their accessories be altogether different. So the sneaker itself will be, access, will be, you know, will be accepted, but that necessarily what they wear with the sneakers. That's what's so amazing about sneakers. You know, uh, everybody will buy a certain sneaker, and I get all kind of people who... You know, the hustlers, the hardcore hustlers. And they will buy the same sneakers, Kanye or Pharrell. But what they wear with it could, would be so radically different. And on that note, I'm going to get out of here with my janky sneakers. Let's thank Dapper Dan and Sasha Jenkins for being here. <laughs>